Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. My guest on One of a Kind is Ugandan-born University of Iowa professor Peter Nazareth. Aided by his multicultural background, Professor Nazareth teaches world literature courses in the Department of English. He was born in Uganda in 1940 when his country was under the British colonial rule. Schooled in his home country, Peter received a BA in 1962 from Makareri University College in Kampala and in 1965 a postgraduate diploma in English studies from Leeds University in England. He then returned to Uganda. While working as a senior finance officer in the Ministry of Finance, the dictator Idi Amin came into power through a military coup. Peter had his citizenship removed and was stateless for a time. Fortunately, he was awarded a scholarship to Yale. How he escaped Uganda and landed in New Haven is part of his fascinating story. He came to Iowa as an honorary fellow in the International Writing Program in 1973. He eventually became a valued advisor to the International Writing Program, serving in that capacity for over three decades. Professor Nazareth is an author of many books, articles, and recipient of numerous honors. He and his wife, Mary Nazareth, raised two daughters in Iowa City, Kathy and Monique. Welcome to One of a Kind. Thank you, Ellen. Your story, like I said, begins in Uganda where you were born. You, you came out of quite a multinational family. Yeah, that's true. Um, um, by origin, I'm what is called a Goan. That's from Goa, which is part of India. But my mother was born in Malaysia. Uh, she's Goan too, but the, we have a large family in Malaysia. My maternal grandfather was a professional musician, uh, classical music, and he had a large family. Um, and uh, so I have a really multicultural family in Malaysia. And as for myself, although I grew up as a Goan, in my home, my father would be talking about Goa and my mother about Malaysia. So already there was that notion of multiculturalism, which was not necessarily a question of blood, but with the family, it also became that. How did, how did they get to Uganda? And why Uganda? Well, my, my father's was working in Goa, and the story that I have heard is a late uh, aunt of mine, I mean an aunt who died before I was born, uh, took my father aside and told him to get away from his elder two brothers who were brilliant but who make a lot of money and then lose it all and say, get out <laughs> of their way. And so he decided to come to East Africa to work in the British uh, civil service, and he was a very good civil servant. Now, as to how he met my mother, he went to go on leave and a proposal was brought for my mother uh, from my grandfather and the way I hear the story is my mother didn't know that my grandfather was taking her to Goa to get married. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was really getting married to a stranger and uh, so she came to uh, Uganda and uh, I was born two years <laughs> later. <laughs> and you grew up loving music. Now you had a grandfather who was involved yes. in music, but your uh, music interests were a bit different than your grandfather's. Well, you know, there was music all around me. Goans love music, Africans love music, and we used to buy 78s. Country music is, is my folk music, you know, Jimmy Rogers, uh, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry. I knew who Slim Whitman was when Americans didn't, and then when then Elvis came along. and. Um, I think I got it mainly through my mother, though m I have been told my grandfather, my, my father used to play the drums. And uh, now my grandfather did send me a violin hoping I would learn how to play it, but <laughs> I couldn't play string instruments. I did, however, play harmonica and clarinet. And only two years ago when we were on a visit to Malaysia, uh, one of my uncles told me that my, my grandfather was also a great clarinet player. 
which I didn't know for all these years. So I think there is something about environment, but also mm -hmm. maybe, maybe genes. Well, we're going to come back to Elvis, because I want to talk yes. about your class that you teach. But you, after you left England and came back to Uganda, uh, you went into civil service in the finance department, and then Idi Amin came. Yes. Tell me what happened. Well, my hometown, Entebbe, uh, uh, which, which is a seat of government, and that's what the name means, Entebbe, uh, it's a seat of government, though it was originally a fishing village into Lake Victoria. And it was a civil service town, and if you lived in that place, all you could do was work for the civil service. So I, uh, some time had gone by, I was trying to get back to teaching, but time had gone by, and uh, I'd come back from England, and uh, you know, I was married, we had our young daughter, and I, I had to start working, and all I could do at that point was to join the civil service, which was a central organization, mm -hmm. uh, and then they posted me to the Ministry of Finance, which at first I thought was about the worst place I could have been placed in. But in fact, it turned out to really be the best because the Ministry of Finance is the center of everything. And I was soon involved in, in doing everything. I mean, uh, uh, looking at industries and uh, recommending what should be done to them and foreign aid and, and all these things while at the same time reading World Bank documents mm -hmm. and so on. At the same time, I was re-educating myself because when I was in England, I felt I had been miseducated with, under the colonial system. Mm -hmm. So I got time to read. And since Goans were mainly civil servants, I got to understand Goans very well mm -hmm. too. So it was just the right place. And you were married, you said. Yes. How did you, your wife is from, Tan, what which she's is now Go Tanzania. Yeah, she's a Goan too. And we did meet because people travel back and forth. But uh, as to how we got married, I was about to go to England, and uh, f two friends of mine were getting married in Dar es Salaam, and they invited me, and I just had to go there. And just before that, Mary went to Dar es Salaam, and she, ha she wrote to me that she was there, and I could come and stay for three weeks or as long as I like. And in my mind was this, ah, this is my second chance, because <laughs> when she left Uganda uh, 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 three years earlier, I remember feeling a real sense of regret. And I said, ah, this is my chance. That explains why when I went there, in three weeks' time, I proposed to her and she accepted. And I came back, I went to England, came back, we were married uh, three to four months later. And here we are. Here you are. And when Amin took over, were you and your wife and your parents in danger? Or not, not, not at I, the beginning? Not in any specific way. The thing was much more chaotic. Uh, uh, than you, you tell from a distance because you never knew what would happen. My citizenship was taken away, but nothing directed against me. There are people who think that it was taken away because um, nine days after my novel was launched in a brown mantle, the expulsion was announced by Idi Amin, which is prophesied in the novel. In fact, the, my character has a dream about the expulsion, which is a dream I really had and got up and wrote in a days as I was writing that novel. Mm. But, and if that were the case, uh, well, it would have been extremely dangerous for me. It was completely a random bureaucratic thing which would take too long to explain. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it was that novel. In that a brown led, mantle. Yes. Uh, that novel led me uh, to be invited to the United States. Um, uh, it, it was taken by our uh, friend, Elliot Lehman of Skokie, Illinois. Uh, to, uh, to Yale, where a fellowship was established in memory of the late Dr. Seymour Lussman, who had died in a drowning accident the year before. And Elliot said, this is a person to invite because they wanted to invite creative people to Yale. And he, they said, you have anything of his? He said, I have this novel, which I told, told the publisher to send him. By the way, he was the father, his son had studied with me at least. That's how I got to know him when he came on a visit. You were in the newspapers at Yale with the, your picture yes, and, yes. and w briefly tell in a brown mantle, what exactly is, is it about the uh, your history of your country? Well, it was, it's a, a political time? novel. It's a political novel and the protagonist who tells the story is a Goan like me, but he was a politician and this provided a certain perspective. He's in exile in London and he, it triggers, what triggers uh, his telling of the story is he has read about the attempted assassination of his colleague whom he actually ran away from, betrayed in fact. And he confesses, but 
any Catholic knows that when you confess, you try to hide the big sin from the, <laughs> the father confessor. Mm -hmm. So the big sin is actually hidden there. He goes back and forth. And as he goes back and forth, the history of Goa comes in, his own moral weaknesses and all these kinds of things. Now, it's actually uh, quite a complex novel. And the people in, the, uh, 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 in child psychiatry, because that's where Simu Lustman was, um, they didn't know how to read a novel, and so they turned to Charles Davis, who had just come from Iowa the year before. And he read the novel and told them to give me the fellowship. I only knew this when I got to Yale. So you met Charles Davis, who was at University of Iowa at Yale? At Yale. He had wow. just gone there to chair Afro-American oh. studies and be a professor and of English. And he told you to look into coming to Iowa? Not just that. He, he said, Iowa's the place for you to be. And, and he made sure that I was invited here. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure he's the one who told Paul Engel about me, told Darwin Turner, and because of Charles Davis, then we moved this way. And he was absolutely right. Iowa was the place for, for me to, for us to be. And all these names, you know, Charles Davis yes. that people know, yes. Paul Engel, you know, Wallin Engel, yes. and you know, now Christopher Merrill, an international writing workshop, and you yes. came with an, uh, in the International Writing Workshop, and now you, and then you stayed, you've been an advisor, a very respected and valued advisor. Well, you know, we, we were here, I thought I would go back, but not while Idi Amin was there. Now, how I would do it, I didn't know, because my wife didn't want to go back, my daughters. They didn't want to go back no, to Uganda? No, because they remember all those tensions and, uh, you know, uh, friends disappearing and uh, all those kinds of things. and. Uh, you know, playing with kids and all, asking us where was where is their father, and we only find out here, because the the brother of the father was Father Okumu, who came here and we met. He's in Iowa. Turns out his his brother was killed uh, by Amin, and our kids didn't know that. So all of that, all those tensions, they didn't want to go back. But meanwhile, we were here, and Paul and Hualing were so good with children. They invited us. They took us on a boat ride. They said, bring the children there. They got so involved with writers that Monique, Monique, who works for Fresh Air for Terry Gross as a producer, told me that it's, it's here that she met Sebastian Barry, the Irish writer. I'm aware of this. And here she wrote about him at West High School. But all those years later, she's the one who pitched the story to Terry about interviewing Barry. And that, that's what they did. And she said, it I all came from here. That's it great. all came from here. Mm -hmm. But I have to add one more thing here. Yes, and I want you to tell briefly about your book about Idi Amin. Too. Oh, it, it was, that was not directly about Amin, but if you read between the lines, and I was trying to protect myself there. Sure. Uh, I, I, you know, when they launched the novel, the publishers launched the novel in Kampala, they wanted me to select a guest of honor. First of all, I didn't want any publicity because it wasn't safe. And then I chose Henry Barlow, the poet, who was also a bureaucrat, because I knew he'd give a speech such that we wouldn't be killed. And uh, I heard from the Ugandan writer this time, uh, Glaida Namukasa, that he died a few years ago. But I guess he died of old age, not by being killed by good, that good. <laughs> army. Yes. And, uh, but when we were here, mixing up with all the writers, I began to slowly, it took some time, for me to realize that I was in the right company to grow as a writer. I already had this experience under my belt. If I'd come here at 22, it would have been different. I came here 32, mm -hmm. well, 33 to Iowa. So I had all this experience. Now I began to meet people from all, writers from all over the world, and they began to have a, a real influence on me. Uh, those I really admired, and sometimes, you know, that guy's a writer, I'm better than that. <laughs> but at some point, uh, within a few weeks, my wife and I said, we are living in Iowa, this is farmland. This is, uh, we're only meeting writers, we want to meet farmers. So uh, Gene Hood of the university mm -hmm. spoke to John Dane, and John and Ellie Dane offered to be our, our host family. And they came, and they took us, and we have remained friends ever since. That is from early 74. We have been friends. They kept us rooted, although at the same time, you know, they're very global people. Mm -hmm. And we still joke about this, uh, you know, that they, they wondered when they offered whether we spoke English. And we wondered whether they spoke English because they are Republicans. Mm -hmm. And uh, they love me to tell that joke. 
And uh, this may not be the right time to mention it because, oh. uh, but you know, we always laugh sure. about it because they thought we came from Uganda and all that. The thing is on a certain level, this, these kinds of divisions of uh, Democrats, Republicans don't mean a thing. Mm -hmm. It's actually individuals and what values they have and so on. Mm -hmm. So we had, we were in the best place because we had the rootedness and we had the whole, whole globe coming to us. And you got to teach some wonder, talk, let's talk about your teaching. You taught um, in the Afro-American Studies program, mm -hmm. the English department, and what are some of the names of your classes that you've well, taught? Well, when I came in, in Afro, what was then Afro-American Studies, they asked me to teach African literature because I came from Africa. And I was told uh, by somebody, the chair of, of uh, American studies, so he laughed at the end of when he was retiring and he said, you know, when you were coming here, Darwin T Turner thought you were an African and you arrived here and he found you were an Indian. But you so, are African. Well, you I am, yes, yourself... right. so, so people's consciousness yeah. has to be expanded, right? right? So they asked me to teach African literature and I, I hadn't taught for 10 years. I said, well, who, who taught this before? But they said it was taught, but they had no course description or anything. Mm. And so uh, I said, what shall I do? They said, do it your own way. Uh, I was not used to this. The British system, you know, you, they give you something. So I devised a class and I thought, uh, well, people want to learn. So I had a recommended list of three pages. Result, I got one student. Oh. And uh, oh. Fritz and Dijkstra came to me, you know, in a long rush. Let me give you some advice. Don't prepare a course like that again, <laughs> reading list like that. You make something, write something that look, makes it look simple, and when they come in there, you zap them. That was pretty good advice. Um, not that it was going to be any less serious, but right. it was also teaching as entertainment as well as knowledge, you know? So that was my beginning. I learned, uh, you might say, it was on-the-job training, teaching here in Iowa, after being a bureaucrat for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I kept expanding uh, the courses I taught, you know. So it was Afro-American literature, and then did you move on to well, Malaysian li literature? And you've the, written a book about a Singapore poet, so did you teach? Well, the thing was, first African literature, but while I was at Yale on a fellowship, this was a really exciting time for African-American literature and writers, because I met so many great writers and musicians at Yale. I met Alice Walker, and I met met, uh, and sh her agent was Dr. Seuss's agent. So I was talking to her. Dr. Seuss's agent? Yes. The Dr. Seuss? Yes, we had dinner. Hat in the hat? Yes. Seuss, okay. We sat together at dinner and she told me that he had legs like the cat in the hat and put his legs around oh, the table and so. It's a great story. I, I met the whole um, uh, editorial board of Mad Magazine, plus, of course, uh, the you know, Paul Marshall, um, so it's so many Albert Murray and uh, and uh, and I didn't know these were such great people I was just meeting but I began to read their stuff because it I didn't know anything about it in Uganda it was my chance to just read so as it happens by the time I came here I had read a number of African American writers that I was able to teach too so I also began teaching African American literature mm -hmm. and some courses which were well. Jen had course, the literatures of the African peoples, selected African Caribbean, African American, which then got turned uh, into a correspondence course that I taught for 23 years uh, through the Center for Credit Programs. And I got an award for this, the Distinguished Independent Study Course from the National University Continuing Education oh, Association. What a memory you have, that's 19, a <laughs> Well, that was a big award to yes, me. Yes, congratulations. So uh, they gave it to me nicely framed. But I be, the thing was, I was, by my background and interest, I was interested in so many things. In India, in Indian writing. I've been writing about Indian writers. And of course, my mother being born in Malaysia, Malaysia mm -hmm. Singapore is, you know, the, the land is the same. So I was really interested in, uh, in Malaysia. And the first interview I did was the first year I worked for the International Writing Program for Hualing, when she became director in 77. An editor of World Literature Written in English said, you know, please interview some writers for us. So I mentioned it to Edwin Thunbu, with whom I had a connection because he had just directed a dissertation of Theo Luzuka, who designed the cover of my novel in a brown mantle. Mm -hmm. He went from Uganda to, to Singapore. 
And Tambu was very interested, in, and I did an interview with him, and he really took over control. And this was an <laughs> interview of six hours. Hmm. When, when transcribed, it came to 84 pages. So it was published in extracts in many different mm -hmm. places, and always quoted because they see him as the unofficial uh, poet laureate Quoted of Singapore. Singapore. Well, then came the point at which I was invited last year to write this book on Tambu. So I wrote the book and put the whole interview there because people are saying, no, we need the whole interview. Excuse me. The, the, the class that you've gotten a lot of notoriety <laughs> on, that you were, I read on ABC, Nightly News, Good Morning America, uh, yeah. You even got the key to Memphis. I did from I mean, Mayor Herringer. This was, and it, the, the name of the class is Elvis. As Anthology. As Anthology. Oh, tell our viewers about this well, very popular class. Well, you know, I, as I mentioned before, the first thing I heard by Elvis I actually hated, which was Love Me Tender. Oh, tell the, that was before the interview. Tell, the, tell me uh, this story again about well, when you Well, you know, heard rock, it. rock and roll began, became big all over the world in 56, 57, and of course it was Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock. Yes. So I remember going from Kampala, where the university was, where, where I was then teaching at a primary school, to my hometown of Entebbe, and uh, meeting Henry Rodericks, who played with the band, and he produced triumphantly an American rock and roll magazine, and on the cover was this strange guy, Elvis Presley. And I said, who's this? And then he took me to his band leader's house. The band leader, Nobby D'Souza, produced a 78, which he said his brother-in-law brought from England, and uh, he, he said, you cannot get Elvis records here. And he played it, and I thought it was the worst song I ever heard, so <laughs> slow, no drums. I said, this is rock and roll. Well, the next day I was in the city of Kampala, and in a window I saw an LP, and, and, and uh, a, a first LP I ever saw, and it was Elvis Presley. And Nobby had said, you, you won't get Elvis Presley records here. I went to my aunt and said, please give me money to buy this record. We'll never get Elvis Presley here again. How much was it, do you remember? Uh, about it, it was something like uh, 35 shillings, which would be about three American dollars, but really, you could say it was about ten, fifteen dollars. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, now that LP was actually pressed in South Africa, so it doesn't have the Nipper logo, um, which belonged to HMV, his master's mm -hmm. voice. So it all started there. Now, since I bought the record, I had to work at liking it. Oh, so I did. began to listen and listen, and then began to understand it and began to like it. How old were you when you bought this record? Uh, I was uh, uh, 16, I think, 16. nearly 17. And uh, so the question then was, how did I begin teaching this? And it was, I tracked down in Boston, my first visit to Boston to visit my daughter, Kathy, who had graduated and got a job there. And I saw an LP in a window by Chuck Willis. And I knew Elvis had done one of his songs, but I'd never heard Chuck Willis. So I bought the LP, I played that song, I Feel So Bad, played Elvis, and I was stunned. They sounded, at that time, Elvis sounded like he was singing just like Chuck Willis. At a time when he was mainly doing ballads, uh, uh, beat ballads, like It's Now or Never. So when I came back, I played it to my colleague, Jonathan Walton. And Jonathan Walton insisted I should teach a class on Elvis because he, with this interpretation, playing these things together, because he said, nobody in America is listening. And he was persistent. He talk, came and said he talked to Al Stone, the chair of, of uh, American Studies, and I could teach it there and so on. And I didn't want to do it. Uh, I, I did. but, and then Jonathan suddenly died that summer. And the whole university was stunned. He was so popular, and uh, there was a memorial service for him in the old Capitol, you know, Senate chambers. And the spirit moved me, and I said I would teach this class to Jonathan. Mm. And then people began coming to me and said, when are you going to teach this class? <laughs> so over two years went by, and I said, Jonathan Spirit's moving away. I've got to teach this class. And very rapidly, I had, had some ideas. I was ready. And mainly what triggered it was Chuck Berry's autobiography, where the Pope is reading, uh, 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 no, Ishmael reads um, The Terrible Threes, where the Pope is reading Chuck Berry's autobiography and wondering whether he's going to get bumped off like his predecessor. <laughs> The Pope. Mm -hmm. And the very next day I came across Chuck Berry's autobiography, read it, and said, oh, I'm ready. So I call it Elvis as Anthology. 
You imagine a book called Elvis, you open it, inside you find Mario Lanza, Bing Crosby, Little Richard, and so on. Why? Because Elvis was a twin whose twin brother was born dead, and he was always twinning himself to other people. I could hear this in Uganda on the things I could track down, mm -hmm. like when he did It's Now or Never, I knew he was doing Mario Lanza or Soli Mio. In fact, Lanza had died in Rome, some people say mysterious circumstances, mm -hmm. and Elvis was in Germany, and apparently they used to phone each other. So really? he did this intentionally as a tribute to, uh, to Lanza. But uh, tribute is too weak a word. You play them together, uh, the Canadians, uh, I think as it happens, actually ended up splicing the two after they interviewed me and it worked. But hmm. I didn't have the originals of the other things and I now began to track them down and I really taught that class just as a tribute to Jonathan Walton in 92. And the thing that gave me courage to teach it when I didn't feel uh, I was ready was Emerson's statement, do the thing and you'll have the power. Mm -hmm. Not that you get the power first and do it. In fact, one, more, one night I just jumped out of bed laughing th at the thought of Dean Lohenberg having to defend my teaching a class <laughs> on Elvis. Elvis? Yes. Well, once uh, you got on national television and national public radio and... Well, uh, I didn't expect any of that. I thought I was going to teach it once and that would be that it, was the it. tribute. How many years did you teach it? Uh, well, with all that experience and the people coming, the TV people coming there and newspaper interviews and uh, my discovering I could either fly or die and I chose to fly <laughs> and uh, discovering how good the stories were the TV people did. I play them in class, we analyze them. Mm -hmm. Keith Morrison of NBC, um, uh, Chris Bury, I quote them too. I learned from them. I found out that I didn't have much of an opinion of TV people before I had the experience with them. I found out that, that if you challenge them to move to a higher level, they take you further. Mm -hmm. And I admired the way they did it so briefly. So I then said to myself, a student asked me, um, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, are you going to teach this class again? And I said, no. He said, why not? And I said, yeah, why not? I've been put through the mill on this. I mean, I didn't know if I was going to have enough to teach for three weeks. And here I am. It's like <laughs> the loaves of the fishes. Yeah. <laughs> I finished the thing. I have three enough minutes. So I, I decided to continue. And I didn't know that with all that publicity, it was spread globally all over the world. Um, it's written about in Alienation by Simon Tay, one of the international writers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he mentions my class there. And uh, I, I reviewed that book and uh, for World Literature Today. And that review was one that they selected for their inclusion in the 20th century literature in English. The thing has gone and spread. I estimate that over 700 million people found out about that class. And are you still teaching it? Yes. You are. I am. You are. And what are the, what are the students coming? What, are they, what do they want to learn? Or what do they want to, well, what's in, their intent? Uh, I don't ask that my students should love Elvis before they come. I mm -hmm. don't mind what they think, but that they should listen. Mm -hmm. And I, when I play this stuff, remember Jonathan's statement to people are not listening. When I play the original and Elvis, there's a complex dialogue that takes place. It's not just copying. Mm -hmm. It's reversing, turning upside down. Elvis sometimes removes words, sometimes changes words, sometimes combines many different people. And then, so we go into history, we go into politics, we go into spirituality. And, and music, obviously. Music, music majors uh, are taking your his uh, history some majors, do as well. I English had, majors. A few years ago, I had a student who took my class who was actually majoring in, in music, mm -hmm. and she had never heard of Mario Lanza. She learned it from my class. And she wrote her long paper on Mario Lanza. Mm. So Elvis then becomes a gateway in my class because I had to give them the option of a long sure. paper. Um, there was, of course, uh, sometimes I, I allow also for people to, to, to have projects. And Austin uh, Chamberlain, you know, the Chamberlain family, Austin Chamberlain uh, came to me at the end of one class and said, well, you know, um, I'd like to work on a project. And apparently, and I wasn't listening, he said he wanted to make a jumpsuit. And uh, I said, well, you may just come back from Israel where I was invited to give three presentations on Elvis. And I met the Israeli Elvis and I found out he couldn't afford a jumpsuit. So apparently I said to Austin, well, make it the size of the Israeli Elvis so he can use it. <laughs> and then came the time for the papers to come in and Austin phoned me up and said, I'm ready to prepare the jumpsuit. 
uh, what size is the Israeli Elvis? I asked my wife, what size is the Israeli Elvis? She said, he's the same size as you. I said, okay, he's the same size as me, but look, how can I evaluate a jumpsuit? You've got to write something as well. Well, he did. He prepared a brilliant jumpsuit. I, I know because a few months later, I was in Tupelo and in Memphis, mm -hmm. and, and he wrote in his paper that Elvis was born in a jumpsuit, <laughs> but nobody could see it. So to understand it, you had to make a jumpsuit. And he said nobody was thrilled about this until he went to Sofro Products <laughs> and they had paid. So this thing has been expanding my yeah. consciousness too. Yeah. I discovered just the significance of the jumpsuit. You know, there are symbols on the jumpsuits from many different cultures, the tiger, mm -hmm. the phoenix, the thunderbird. And I got the explanation actually from Peter Gabriel. He was asked, why did he dress in a, like a flower when he performed? He said to bring things up from the buried subconscious of the English people. Elvis, I realized, was bringing it up from the buried subconscious of America, but the whole world too. Mm -hmm. So instead of this class <coughs> remaining there, it keeps on changing all the time. Well, we could, we could spend a whole hour on, or more on this class, but I've got a couple more questions yeah. to ask you. I always ask my guests who or what made a uh, major influence on your life. Well, it's, uh, it, it's a lot of things. Uh, I'm, I can't pick on, pick on just one, but if you ask me who are some of my favorite writers, it would be, uh, it, it be Ngugi Wa Thiongo, who was a classmate of mine, uh, and we knew each other from, who was very famous in mm -hmm. Africa. And uh, Ishmael Reed, I love his humor and the way he deals with serious issues in a very funny way, draws from comic book cartoons and so on. Uh, music, there's a whole lot of people that I love. I love Georgie Fame, the English uh, blues man, John Mayall, and, and there are just too many to name. I mean, Elvis becomes greater when I play the originals with him. I, I love Jerry, Jerry Lee Lewis, they, the, what do they call him, the, 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 the insane genius or something mm -hmm. like that? Uh, when when uh, the spirit moves him, but, you know, there's a lot of people. I think when you're younger, you think of one or two or three people. But as you, get, as you get older, then it, the influence goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. But I, if you ask me who are some of the people I really appreciate, I would say Paul Engel would be one of them with Hualing for creating this program w w and offering us a place in it where I could grow, my children could grow, and I could go in many different ways, mm -hmm. not necessarily ways that Paul Engel would like. Mm -hmm. He hated Elvis. <laughs> he hated Elvis. Uh, yes. <laughs> he got a mean look on his face <laughs> when I mentioned <laughs> Elvis. No, but uh, you know, he, people who create sure. situations that others can grow in, like Chris Merrill is doing mm -hmm. now. And Chris is one of the people I admire because he is a person who, like my father, always appreciates the creativeness of other people. Mm. I never knew my father to be envious of anybody's creativeness. It was the opposite. That's how I was brought up. And Chris does the same thing. And, and we don't all have to be the same. Mm -hmm. But a generous spirit. Yes. That's, 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 he's also a very good writer and mm -hmm. a very spiritual writer. Yeah, right. So, I want to just, my last question, we mentioned your daughters. Yes. But I, briefly tell the viewers where they are and what they're about. And I know you have two grandchildren. Yes. Uh, Kathy is our firstborn. Uh, she was born in England when I was studying there. And Monique was born two years later in Uganda. And they're uh, West High graduates. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mentioned at Monique's wedding, because of course she didn't know it, that when uh, my wife was expecting her, we had to actually travel to the doctor uh, uh, 25 miles away when there were roadblocks and so on. There had been a coup attempt and so on and so on. So from the beginning, before she was born, she was in situations that were wild and crazy. Um, Kathy is a software programmer. Now she works, uh, she works for mobile and works mainly out of the home. She's married to Randy Eccles, who they, they met when they were studying computer science here, but he subsequently went and became a doctor, and he was a doctor in the army. Um, he's he was a captain and you know, he was a major. And now he works I, I, I for a private firm that mm -hmm. I think is Grandman, Northrop Grandman. Uh, and, and they have they, two sons. They have two sons. Christopher, who's now 11, mm -hmm. and Aiden, who's nine, who are basketball fiends. 
and I dedicated my Tambu book to them as my basketball coaches because when I was writing the book, they would take me out to play basketball and they taught me basketball. I didn't know bas I never saw basketball till I was 25. Mm -hmm. And Aiden said that, uh, you know, I was the MVP and the rookie <laughs> of the year. So I've, all that is in my dedication. That's and I it. dedicated the book, signed it to them, so they will be writers. Right Monique works as a software, uh, uh, sorry, a producer for Terry Gross, who okay. is one of the best interviewers in the country. Absolutely. Fresh and Air, she, National Public Radio. And her husband is also a doctor, uh -huh. uh, uh, Patrick Cronin. So I guess uh, they did all right. I, I'd say so. I got the very last question is, when you have your friends internationally and they say to you, why Iowa? Why are you, why are you still at Iowa? Is it, is it because of the International Writing Workshop, the, the, the community, yeah, yes. they, the support? Uh, it, it's all those things. It's all, it's, it's all those things in this environment. There is time in Iowa. Things grow. Although people, always, uh, people move all over the United States, there are people who stay here, who live here. I mentioned the Danes. You will look mm -hmm. how many years we have been really good friends. And they've seen our children grow. We've seen their children grow. We know there is a real sense of community and, and uh, helping people in trouble. Well, pipes in our house uh, burst um, uh, on 31st December 2000. And we, were, we were away in, in Kentucky because that's where our daughter and Randy were, our grandsons. And we were away and we phoned Jim Dane and he went to our house with his brother-in-law, whom I still haven't met, 10 minutes before midnight to remove all the stuff. <coughs> the pipes were still flowing. He called on people to pump the water out. There's a real s spirit of, of pioneering cooperation and helpfulness here, which you appreciate. You see it when there's trouble, but it's there all the mm -hmm. time. So we got rootedness first. And secondly, the world coming to us, and then time to meet people. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as meeting somebody, a writer, for one hour, two hours. You absorb the personality, you read the stuff, and then I do interviews. And I did dozens of interviews over the years, which have been placed online. To do all of that, I had to keep growing. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you are happiest when you're growing. Mm -hmm. If you're not growing, you're shrinking. You can't stay at the same spot. And this was a place that could happen. So whenever my wife and I travel, when we come back, we have a sense that this is home. Mm -hmm. And you did uh, 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 say to me earlier on that I love to travel. I love to try and stay in one spot, mm -hmm. but I'm always traveling. traveling. <laughs> but I'm staying the most in, uh, we are staying this the most in. This is home to you, and I think as that close to home, home as, it, as it can be. On that wonderfully positive note, I will say thank you for being my guest on One of a Kind. Thank you, Ellen. My guest on One of a Kind has been English professor Peter Nazareth. His story has taken him from Uganda to England, back to Uganda, and eventually to the University of Iowa. Peter has taught here at the university for 35 years and is beloved and respected by his students. Most of them. <laughs> <laughs> Words used to describe my guest are engaged, thoughtful, kind of rock and roll enthusiast, traveler, and inspiring. Peter Nazareth is one of a kind.